I know who you are just by deciding to watch this video. You are a band student in high school or middle school. You started out playing trumpet, and one day, somewhere down the line, your music teacher proclaimed that the band needs a euphonium player, likely along with a tuba player. And either you volunteer because you are bored with your current instrument and you want something new, or your band teacher, without your consent, puts this big old pile of rust that's been sitting in the back of the band closet for a millennia because they just think that it would make a good fit for you. And if any of what I just said applies to you, then I am sure that you can empathize with the subject of this video. WHERE THE HELL ARE ALL OF THE EUPHONIUMS? This is a thing that I'm sure has frustrated young euphonium players forever. They see all of their friends playing these instruments like the trombone that are featured everywhere in so many different styles of music. And then there's you, building your skills on the euphonium. And to become a professional in music, it seems as if your only option is to quickly switch over to and master another more common instrument. The music genres that frequently feature the euphonium are few and far between, and to see why this is, we're gonna have to go back in time a little. There are many people that are credited for inventing the euphonium. After the creation of several different tenor-voiced valved brass instruments, the first true version of the euphonium was invented by a German man named Ferdinand Sommer in the year 1843. Years later, in 1874, the first modern British-style compensating euphonium was invented this time by a British man named David Blakely. This is a relatively late start for the instrument, as most composers at the time were already used to the standard symphonic setup. The only spots that the euphonium could have been placed in were already filled by other instruments. It couldn't be a bass instrument because of the tubas, it couldn't be a tenor instrument because of the trombones, and it couldn't even be a solo instrument because they already had oboes. Fucking oboes. Every time. But even though many rejected the euphonium, it still managed to catch on in at least some degree. The instrument became very popular in the local brass bands throughout Europe, and found use in various military marches. The euphonium around the time of its invention actually had pretty good success in brass bands, but for some reason it was way more popular in Great Britain. Over the years, the popularity of the euphonium in the British brass band seeped into concert band music, where many composers became aware of the instrument's capabilities, making the euphonium a staple of the concert band. This also, of course, brought its way over to the United States, where the euphonium was also common in concert band music. But more interestingly, a few orchestral pieces started to pop up that allowed the use of the euphonium as either a substitute for a very similar and very obsolete instrument, or even specifically calling for the euphonium. The most famous of these by far is Gustav Holst's suite The Planets, which features the euphonium in several movements, as well as a solo. What is definitely one of the coolest uses of the euphonium also began in about this time. After the First World War, veterans and civilians of the United States came together and formed drum and bugle corps styled after military drum and bugle call units. It wasn't long before they developed baritone bugles, which were basically just valveless, forward-facing euphoniums. These bands eventually evolved into the drum corps of the 60s and the 70s, and with the introduction of Drum Corps International in 1972, even more possibilities opened up for the instruments used in these drum corps, like multiple valves. Also, every brass instrument had to be in the key of G until 1999. Being born with the genre, euphoniums, no matter how many valves they had or if they were in a stupid key, are an essential part of the drum corps that we see across America today. Speaking of solos, that's pretty much what made up the rest of the euphonium's repertoire. For a long time, these solos were just borrowed from the cornet, bassoon, or the euphonium's best friend, the trombone. Sometimes you would see original euphonium solos like Joseph DeLuca's Beautiful Colorado, but for a long while, the euphonium was ignored by many. However, sometime around the 1960s, something happened. Almost like a euphonium renaissance, some American composers began to seriously write some music for the euphonium, including accompanied solos, unaccompanied solos, small ensembles, and even concertos written for the euphonium. The absolute state of the euphonium is certainly better now than it has ever been. Drum corps, concert bands, and brass bands are all as lively as ever, and more and more composers every day are recognizing the strengths of the instrument and are incorporating it into their music. But despite these few examples, the euphonium remains a relatively obscure instrument, 
And this is something that euphonium players around the world and across generations have struggled with. Oh, so you're in the school band. What instrument do you play? I play the euphonium. The what? It's like a small tuba. Being belittled as a mini tuba is not at all what this instrument deserves. The euphonium has an incredibly impressive range, even said to be the largest range of any brass instrument. It is capable of extremely technically demanding parts, and with enough time and practice, the euphonium can produce a beautifully sweet and dark sound that is just unmistakable for any crappy old French horn. I mean, the name literally means sweet sound, so what can you expect? A movement of euphonium and jazz has been growing over the past years. The late Rich Madison is a famous example of this. The euphonium can be seen performing beautiful solos, and its sound is so unique to the jazz world. Jazz euphonium just seems to be growing, and I'm interested to see if this becomes more prominent. A lot of colleges let you major in euphonium, and believe it or not, there do exist professional euphonium players, but it is extremely rare to see full-time professional euphonium players. Now, you could argue that pretty much all musicians have to teach as well because they don't get paid enough, and... Well, yeah, that is absolutely true, but... Becoming pro at the euphonium is not nearly as recognized as other instruments, and the unfortunate truth is that while other instrument players may find quite a lot of jobs playing their instruments, for the euphonium, unless you try for one of the very few extremely competitive pro wind ensembles, or one of the military wind ensembles which are also ridiculously competitive, you pretty much have to be a teacher while playing small unpaid gigs at the side. Now to conclude this video that has absolutely no point, I would just like to say this. We need more euphoniums! A lot of band kids wind up playing the euphonium and then realizing that if they want to go into music professionally, they'll probably have to work a lot harder and have way less opportunities than someone who plays a different instrument like the trumpet that is featured in like a bajillion genres, or even something that is featured in similarly few genres but those genres are so widespread and expansive to justify learning professionally. Hopefully, in the future, we can see more players try their hardest to spread the use of the euphonium across the genres, and let more young euphonium players consider music in their future beyond high school band. Now, I will leave you with one request. Saxophone players, please stop whining about how you're not in the orchestra. Thanks for watching.